Good morning and welcome to Ireland AM on Virgin Media One. It's lovely to have you with us. It's October uh, Thursday, the 24th of October. And here's some of what's coming up on today's show. Yeah, we have a busy old we show of the next three hours. Now, one in four Irish adults have less than 500 euro for a rainy day fund. That's according to a new survey. So financial advisor Paul Merriman is going to be talking to us about your saving habits and giving you some saving tips at 7.35. Yes, we have over 150 billion, billion. on deposit. So one thing Who owns that, that? A small number of people have an awful lot of money yeah. in this country. Uh, later on, investigative journalist Nicola Tallon, she's been going to give us an insight into criminals, drugs and the sins of the underworld. She's got a brand new book, but of course, she's been breaking stories to do with uh, the doll and Jerry the Monk Hutch. We will have the latest on that at 8.15. So after his arrest now, will he be running for the election? Well, well no, we'll he wasn't. No, no, they went into his home. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay, he wasn't arrested. Arrested. Yes. yes, yes. Now we catch up with Auto and Beauty Insider and veteran model Ruth Crilly as she lifts the lid on the fashion industry. Yeah, she's very, very, very funny on social media. Now movie man Brian Lloyd, he is here with this week's top TV and movie picks, including a high stakes political drama mm. and some homegrown Irish talent. Brian, do tell us more. Yes, so we're going to be talking about season two of The Diplomat. That starts back on Netflix next week. Yeah, yes. right, Kerry Russell. Yes. Brilliant. Uh, going to be talking about season two of Bad Sister the uh, trailer for it was released yesterday. That's the new show on Apple TV. That's not going to be starting though until later on in the year. We're also going to be talking about The Wild Robot in cinemas and going to be talking about a new film with Julianne Moore until the Swinton called The Room Next Door. So, yeah. Lots there. going and on there. Was, well, remember we, weeks ago we were talking about the standing ovations at Cannes. That got about a 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it was <laughs> massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a big thing. It was Pedro Almodovar as well, a famous art house. Yeah. So, like, if he was going to get a big He was ovation, going to get it. It would have been in Cannes, yeah. That's due for Brian this morning. Standing, Standing ovation. ovation. Well Thank done. you very much. Well done. Thank, Thank you, you, Brian. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now, Derek's being extremely cultured in Cork this morning. What are you up to? Oh, lovely location. Oh, very nice. Look at that. <laughs> Modma. Yeah, it looks great. Modma, Alan Nuggets, Mern. Well, following our trip to Kilkenny yesterday, we've landed down here in Cork this morning. Now, it's a bit of a damp and breezy start out there this morning, guys. In fact, we have plenty of rain and a status yellow rain warning here for Cork itself. It's neighbour Kerry, Clare, Limerick, Galway and Mayo in the firing line out there today with some heavy rain and a potential risk of localised spot flooding. So not good news for living here in the west and south later on today. We'll have more on that in a bit. Anyway, we've come down here to the heart of Cork City Centre this morning to time with Virgin Media's two gig full fibre broadband rollout now rolled out right across the city and county and also to tie in with the Cork Jazz Festival. Now it's up and running 46 years since 1978, one of the longest musical festivals in the country. We're going to be catching up with Brian uh, Jackson. He is one of the top US jazz musicians uh, across the pond. We've got a live performance here at um, the church, St. Peter's Church here, just over our shoulder. The acoustics are going to be incredible. Get yourselves down, the M8 guys. <laughs> the gig's kicking off later on this morning. Come down. It's always Loving a great it, weekend. Always. I saw Gregory Porter walking around Dublin town yesterday, or was it two oh. days ago? So I assume that he'll be he heading down there down as well. Court. Yeah, he was with his kids and his wife. Lovely. Now, coming up after the break, we'll be talking about why retailers are calling for us to have night courts. They want night court sitting because so much shoplifting is going on around the country. If you're someone who works in retail, we would love to hear from you. 0896 111 Can you see that happening? No. No, no. but we'll talk about it. We like yeah. talking about things. Uh, back with you in a minute. I've seen a few minutes. No. <laughs> Welcome back. It's time to take a look at this morning's papers. We're going to start with the Irish Times. The headline there, boy reported missing day after warning. A family member of Kyron Dernan <clears throat> reported him and his mother missing in August, just 24 hours after Tusla went to Angkor the Siakana and officially flagged its concern for the boy's welfare. Blow to renters as new Airbnb laws shelved for election. Renters have been hit with a fresh blow after it emerged the government's long-promised clampdown on Airbnb listings and other short-term lets will not be brought before the election. Uh, not, be, not be brought before the election. That's from page of the Irish Independent. And the Irish Daily Mail goes with election will be held on Friday the 29th of November. Simon Harris will call the general election on Friday uh, for uh, on November the 8th for a polling day on November 29th. Senior government sources have told exclusively to the Irish Daily Mail. Look at you. He was taking you, you, you a ball. You and Connell's here going, OK. <laughs> uh, the examiner leads with Hutch held after police raids in Spain. Jerry the Monk Hutch is understood 
to have been detained in Spain as part of an international police investigation into suspected money laundering. Spanish guards close in on the monk, an operation targeting senior members of the Hutch organized crime gang is expected to result in a number of high profile arrests in Spain. That's the top story on the Herald. And the Sun and the Mirror also lead with this story. The Mirror goes with, put your lands up, 61 year old Hutch was detained in an early morning swoop in Lanzarote while Gardi also searched his home in Dublin. The star also goes with uh, that story. It's a deal gone to L for the monk. It's doll gone to L for the monk. It's Sorry, lads. God. Now, Nicola Sorry. Talent, journalist Nicola Talent, is going to be joining us a little later on to discuss all those gangland violence and the latest developments with Jerry Hutch. So we're going to be chatting to her at 8.15 in more detail about that. But here to discuss some of the other stories in the news this morning, our political editor of the Sunday Times, Hugh O'Connell, and Lorcan Nyan from the Communications Clinic. Did you know that the election is on now? The front page, you were looking at the front page of the mail. Did you know that? I had a sneaking suspicion. Sneaking suspicion. That something was happening in November. I couldn't get the story over the line. You can't get every story, right? We're going to go international for the first story today, Lorcan, and this is the rape trial that's being held in France of Giselle Pellicot and she took to the stand yesterday. Yeah, look, I, I think everybody's in, in awe of the uh, of, of this woman that the, the I suppose w w what she had to go through, the ordeal she had to go through, which I don't think we need, we need to recount here, um, but also just the way she's been trying to make, I suppose, the people of France. And I think all of us actually just face up to, to the facts of this case. So she took to the stand um, to directly um, address it, um, talked about how, look, the, the profile of a rapist is not somebody you meet late night in the car park. It, it, it is invariably somebody you know, and talked about how, you know, people keep saying that she she is courage, but saying that she herself doesn't see it as, as courage, but more of a determination um, to make society change. Look, just be, because of, of what happened here, because, you know, the, the, the amount of instances of rape you're talking about, the amount of men who were involved in this, and the fact that, as she said herself, it, it was her husband, but it was a husband who she would always have said and consistently said she was so lucky to have by her side that she saw as perfect. And I think what it probably says to us all is, you know, we, we know it's consistent situations where people are accused and there are people who come out and say, no, that's not the person I know. Or, you know, I'll write a reference for them because I can't believe they would do that. You know, we don't know. We you don't. just don't know what people are actually like. Um, behind closed doors or or in their own mind. And I think this is a reminder for us all. But I just think I think we're in awe of this woman, yeah. the strength that she is showing. Um, and I don't think there's been a, a woman like it or a case like it. No. It, it, it is genuinely unique, um, the strength that she is showing. And to, to take to the stand, and she did say yesterday, and it's so powerful, when we are raped, we are ashamed. But it is not up to us to be ashamed. It is up to them to be ashamed. It was day 35 of the trial, which is continuing in France. And I just think it's amazing what that woman It's amazing. Um, and you see them outside the do. court applauding her as they go in and hundreds of people. Imagine. It's just incredible. Uh, Hugh, let's move on to another story here. Irish retailers calling for night courts. Why? Yeah, this is because there has, and this is an extraordinary statistic, a 100% increase in antisocial behaviour, shoplifting and threats between 2021 and 2024. So 100% increase in, th in three years. So this is retailers basically saying that there's an epidemic of shoplifting now that they're uh, encountering. And so they want cr measures to crack down on this. And one of the interesting aspects, aspects of this is not night courts, which I think are unlikely in the short term, mm. but th there's a situation that some retailers are describing now where they're being sued for defamation because they're accusing someone in a gang of youths whose job it is to distract the shopkeeper while others carry out the shoplifting. But that person that is doing the distracting is, is not technically committing a yeah. crime. And so then the parents are coming in uh, or someone on that person's young person's behalf suing for defamation. And the way our defamation laws in this country are structured at the moment are not just bad for the media. That's a whole other argument. But that in this instance that they're having to settle these uh, shopkeepers for, you know, 12,000 euros. So they would actually sue them other. because you said my son was shoplifting Correct. or yes. my yeah. daughter was shoplifting. And yeah. Invariably, the insurers for the uh, for the retailers would, have would to say, pay up. you know, you're better off settling this rather than going through the courts because it's just yeah. going to end up costing you more. So you're talking about five five figure sums being handed so out. So is this a whole are... new thing that they've caught well, I... on that this can, we, we do this? But surely it's an awful lot of things to go through. To get a, to get some money though. Well, I mean, it's not in the no, verb because you get you a just, no claim solicitor. Yeah, you put you get a no you put a claim in, and then as I said, the insurer will usually advise the shopkeeper to settle. So it's not actually yeah. that much of a rigmarole. <laughs>
uh, to, to go through. But I mean, I don't know how prevalent this is, but the, the, there were two examples cited in yeah. some of the reporting today, which which gives me an indication that this is something that's increasing. Something that's actually issue. happening. Yeah. And it's happening at night when an awful lot of shopkeepers are incredibly vulnerable. Yeah. They're just standing there. Yeah. There's not yeah. a huge amount going on. You know, our security guards are, you know, they're just doing all they can, but it has to be hard. And we know it can be aggro. I remember a few years ago, Lorcan, watching when they were putting baby formula in America behind security, you know, because shoplifting yeah. had gotten so prevalent. This is a global phenomenon. Mm. There, I've been watching it on the news in the UK. At, there's organised crime groups involved in these shoplifting sprees that they're trying to tackle over there. But it's happening here as well. It's just, it's become a thing. Yeah, and look, I think there's maybe there's maybe two different versions of it that have increased and have led to that 100% figure. Some of it is that, that kind of youth-based stuff, um, particularly on, on e-scooters and things like that. So it's kind of you know, gangs of younger people, younger people doing it and being involved. And then there's also the, the slightly more violent version of it, which tends to be people who are who are suffering with, with drug addiction. Um, oh, yeah. And there's a, a, a small store owner, Willie O'Brien from Cork, who's got quotes within this, who I thought was particularly impressive, actually, in his quotes. Number one, he's identified one of the reasons for it which is people have left less cash, yeah. less cash to give people on the street and therefore people have been resorted to sh shoplifting. This guy has been spat on, he has been hit, but you know, he saw and he's been shoplifted his store loads and loads of times. But he is saying himself, he doesn't actually blame the people who are doing it. He is saying, look, like they're, they're in a bad situation and rehabilitation is what we, is what he is calling for. He's the victim of it and he is calling for a significant rehabilitation. But I think you need both, don't you? You, you, you need a stronger presence of guards. We've talked about that consistently on city yeah. centres. But look, we're not going to get... Street like, like where I live, I witnessed this last week where four, four guys on e-scooters mm went into the shop, we're going around the shop, there's one security guard, he's walking around after them, he's going, come on lads, can you get out? And they're just knocking things off shelves and he's saying, so what do you do? You call, I know you call the police there in Kulak or Malahide, whatever. But they don't they're care when the guards get, do anything either. They're not going to get there for hours. Yeah. So I think what, that's like, the, the idea of didn't have the night court being the solution to this. That's obviously, look, night courts are big in New York. There's even a, a, a renewal of a sitcom about the night court yes. of, yeah. of, of, yeah. of New York, that is. But all a night court is is just the exact same as a normal court. It just happens in the evening yeah. for people who can't make the court during the day. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's nothing spe specific about a night court that's going to deal with this issue. If the if the guards aren't there, if the legislation isn't there, if the enforcement of said legislation yeah. Yeah. isn't there, like, the courts aren't aren't the issue yeah. here. It, this stuff is, you know, I mean, the, the enforcement. The, the Dublin City Task Force were Report out this week, I think, said a thousand extra guards. But we're going to go. How is that going to happen? That, so In the Irish Times issue. today, Laura Linnett is writing about this, and as you said, very interesting what Willie O'Brien said, a Cork City retailer, in relation to people who are in addiction who are doing this. And he's like, "Where's the help for them?" Which I thought was quite amazing. And they're also um, indicating a case in Dublin about an eight-year-old who was going on sprees. So it's a really interesting read if you want to. But we'd like to hear from you if you're a retailer. What's going on? 0896 triple one triple one. Is it something yeah. they have to think about all the time? I know. Remember when I worked there? There's people who used to come in with the with the anti taggers to take it off the clothes, oh, yeah. and you'd be like, "Well, what am I going to do?" Do you know? I was like you a 22 year old yourself, girl, and I wasn't going. Well, I'm not going up against this. No. You know what Hugh, I mean? Are you ever late for work? No. Oh, <laughs> Laura, can he ever late for work? I'm apparently like one of 96% of employees who's never late for work, which is a lie. So this is the thing where a recent survey, 46% of workers are resentful. I can understand this. Of course you're going to understand this. You're going to be resentful if you're in the office, bang on, and somebody who comes in late yeah. on a regular basis and goes, oh, the weather was terrible, the bus was late, <laughs> I slept it out and they're arriving in 20, 25 minutes after you've been sitting there, of course you're going to be resentful yeah, of that. It's a, a job that is a survey, but as Hugh says, 96% of people say they're always arrived to work on time. I so can't see 96%. Oh, no way. No way do 96% of people yeah, arrive on time. Half of those people are lying. And yet, yeah, you know, I'm saying it here now. 46% of people then are resentful. So it's just 4%, but it's 46% of people are <laughs> resentful, you know? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people. So, yeah, 4% so. of those people are on time. Yeah, yeah. 46% of them are resentful. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think we, we tend to judge ourselves on our intentions and our best behaviours and everybody else on their, on their actions and, and their worst behaviour. Yeah. But um, you can see where it gets frustrated. I think weather being used as an excuse is, is one of the weaker ones, I would have thought. We're used, this is our weather. What? Yeah, yeah we're like used to, we have to get used to it. And like you woke up, ah, it's raining. I'll be, tw I'll be 20 <laughs> minutes later <laughs> this morning. But in fairness, when it rains, I never understand it's it. Right. When it rains in this city, it's like just, it's gridlock. and around the, it's gridlock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just I don't I like 
How often does it rain in Ireland? And when it rains, everything becomes gridlock. Is that because more people decide to take their car that morning or whatever? I don't they don't know. want to be late. So they, they, don't they, don't, the they want to be one of the 96% to arrive on time. We would love to hear from you. Uh, are you resentful of people at work who are consistently late? How about in your personal life? I'm normally good for work. It's the personal life. Sorry, my friend sets her watch to <laughs> more in time, which is half an hour after we're meant to be meeting. So let us know. 0896 111 Late colleagues, do you want to murder them? Lads, thank you so much. Uh, it's thank been lovely much. having your Hugh O'Connell political editor for the Sunday Times and Lorcan Lyon from the Communications Clinic. Thank Thanks you so a million, much guys. Thank you so much. Now, coming up, financial advisor Paul Merriman joins us uh, with top saving tips. And we're going to be taking a look at the latest movie and television releases with Brian Lloyd. Thanks for staying with us. Now, a new survey by Capital Credit Union has revealed some surprising figures on Irish people's saving habits. Here to discuss and give us some advice on how we can save smarter is financial advisor Paul Merriman. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, we were chatting about this the other day, the survey. It revealed that one in four Irish people have only 500 quid or less or less. In savings. Yes. That's their, that's the rainy day fund. That's, that's the all rainy that they day. have, which yes. seems like a very little amount. For it is a very little amount. And I suppose as an advisor, you'd usually be asking people to hopefully get to a situation where they have a minimum of a thousand euro. Um, so 500 obviously is well below it. But I think there's a lot of good news in that survey as well, to be fair. It's about 25% of people have 500 euro or less. Um, and if you look at, we have a poverty line of about 13% of the population. So half of those 25% are probably in that poverty line. God, that's horrendous, Which is horrendous, isn't it? of course. Um, so yeah, so half of them have like, you know, no income to save. And then the other proportion as well, and it's coming from a credit union as well, so you've got to remember that the other proportion are probably on the lower income and where inflation's got to over the last number of years, if anyone had squirreled any savings away during COVID-19, yes, they they've been it. absolutely wiped out. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it, yeah, the figures are, are, aren't are great for those. And it's obviously very difficult to try and save money um, and try to have anything put aside. But then when you don't, you end up in a worse financial trap because... If anything does go wrong, which the emergency fund is for, mm. like the car breaking down, the fridge, the freezer, kid breaking a window, whatever it is, yeah. um, you end up then going towards credit cards, money lenders, and uh, loans, yeah. and now you're in debt. Mm. If you couldn't afford to save, now you have a debt problem. Uh, and this is the problem. I think it's just a lack of financial literacy um, and also yeah, just lack of income. Like we are in a cost of living crisis and people are yeah. saying that because the survey also said that more than half the people have actually no savings at all, never mind the 500. Yes, yeah, and again, you're down to income. It's 100% down to COVID, since COVID-19, down to inflation, uh, interest rates going through the roof. You know, so we're doing consultation, we're seeing people that would have had savings previously, uh, but they more doubt people on tracker mortgage for argument's sake would have been saving, mm. you know, a lot of cash over the last 10 years are being well cash rich probably because their mortgage is really low. Mm. Since 2022, interest rates have skyrocketed, all that savings yeah. is now going towards paying the mortgage. Yeah. Have our saving habits changed? So yeah. before, like when we were younger, you would have been yeah. told, what is it, 10% 10, 10 of your yeah. salary or your wage, yeah. your weekly wage. you got to put that into savings. Yeah. What's happened? So it looks like those in between 20 and 30 are saving more than ever before from this survey as well, which is great. And I think that's down to social media. I think people in their 20s now, we get this all the time, uh, over an Instagram page are asking really good questions um, and I think it's just down to social media and financial literacy being distributed that way Okay, like that wasn't around when I was a kid yeah. it wasn't taught in school it wasn't there uh, so yeah I would definitely see the saving habits of those earning incomes in between 20 and 30 decent incomes uh, are definitely better than those in their 30s and 40s. Now, you got to remember, in your 30s and 40s, people are typically maybe settling down, having kids, moving around jobs, maybe taking yeah. time out. So it's easier probably to save. If that's expenditure, people are living at home longer as well, so they're not paying oh, rent. Yeah. 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 They can't yeah. buy a house. So there are yeah. all the things that come into it, but they are saving more in their 20s now, which is a great sign. Uh, but you need to have the income to save, and I think that's the biggest that's problem. That's the big thing. That's what's really coming through in the survey. And I think what we were surprised, we, we, we were talking about this the other day, I, we were surprised that men are more likely to have a bit of a financial cushion than women. Yeah. And, I, yeah. Why, and we thought, no. No, no, no I disagree with the survey. Sorry, really? The survey, the survey. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, the yeah. survey's wrong. The sur Paul said the survey's wrong. Uh, uh, no, we no, we all a, looked at each other yeah. and went, really, yeah, men no, are more... experience. I mean, doing this over 20 years, and I definitely would say that females, when they come in for consultations, are well more prepared, uh, much better at saving, 
typically speaking, than men, to be fair. So I was really surprised to see that in the survey. Uh, I was, really? I must say. I'd be interested in that at home if you're in a, a, stra- a heterosexual relationship. What's going on in your uh, savings? 0896 111 or any sort of relationship. Is there someone who's better than the other? Because yeah, I know that. you Bob away. I know yeah. that he's better than me because yeah. yeah. I, I deserve a little treat, Paul. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I deserve okay. a little treat at the end of, at the, end of the week. Um, what should people be doing? Yeah. Okay, so if you have savings, the big thing here is to make sure your savings are working for you. Irish banks have not passed on the deposit interest they're taking from the European Central Bank. They're ripping us. I can't say it any other way. Uh, they can talk about mortgages all they want, the mortgage interest rates, but savers are getting ripped. You need to make sure that your savings are in a high interest account. The best account there at the moment are the easiest, as I think, Revolut. If you have one of the ultra accounts, they're offering up to 3.45% versus some accounts in Ireland that are 0.01%. No, but but like, are the banks not offering, like, if you put them in for two are, or three years? Yeah, but they are, but the Revolut are offering on a daily basis. So but, your interest accrues, you can take it out when you want. But there is an, an, an issue here, yeah. and this is, you know, consumer inertia is one thing, and we like to stick with what we know. I get yeah. that. But when you can't go into a bank, when you can't see someone, and with Revolut, a lot of people would be, with, with some online banks, agree. worried about, is there a chance oh, of you agree. Do you and, know I, I mean? and I think that's where the education piece has to okay. come, because you also have Raisin.ie, and Raisin.ie are bringing European banks into Ireland and offering rates um, from the freedom money around the EU legislation a few years back. So if you, there's just so many more options. I mean, Revolut, okay. it's not just being here singing for Revolut, but even the banks on uh, Raisin.ie, they have the same guarantee up to 100,000 euros as the Irish banks as well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of security to add there. But think about it, getting literally zero. And some banks will give you 2%, you'd lock your money away, et cetera. So, but some people out there this morning are getting 0%. Or the money's in their current account. At least ring your bank. If you want the safety of an Irish bank, ring the bank, go into the branch, get it out of your current account, get it out of your you know, access demand account or your long, mm. the short-term demand account and get it locked away at 2% because yeah. you're going to make more money. But at the same time, people need their current account because the expenditure is coming out that's of their it, current, current account. That's a very good question, a very good point. Current account should just be used for your monthly or your weekly expenses. Wages come in, everything goes out. If you have any savings into a if high yield If it's anything over account. them, you need. And the real reason for this is not just to make the money. We know the European Central Bank is saying they're trying to get inflation down to 2%. Yeah. So if inflation is 2% and you're getting zero, in 10 years, your money's 20% less value. Like, that's mm. madness. You can't, because you work too hard, you pay tax yeah. to get that money into your bank account. It's just the inertia factor is not good enough these days because you need to make your money work hard. Yeah, you have to do a bit of, a yeah, bit of work. Yeah, and we know inertia work, is a yeah. big yeah. thing. Um, despite this, we, the, these reports we've seen over the last two years that we've got the most money on deposit than yes. ever, over 153 billion, billion. euro yes. in Irish deposit accounts. Yes. So someone's making, someone has a lot of money in this country. Is this an indication of the wealth gap getting bigger or what is it? It is. And in fairness, very, it, it's difficult because I mentioned that 13% poverty line. And unfortunately, the only way to get out of poverty line is to have more income. Yeah. That makes sense. But obviously, some people are in the poverty line that might be sick, caring for kids, caring for parents. Like, it's a horrendous place to be. But if you go to the other scale, like there's a lot of people making money in this country. The economy is going exceptionally well. There's a lot of people moving into higher tax bracket, a lot of people making decent cash and they're saving it and they're keeping a deposit but there's also people you know that are over maybe 60 65 70 years of age that have made their money uh, and they have cash and they're sitting and they're keeping it an inertia factor of security the irish banks um and they, they're just leaving it there so yeah there's 150 billion just sitting there 150 billion and thanks earning practically Nothing. zero compared to what they should be. But you look like a vein is about to pop that it's not <laughs> earning anything. Honestly, you can tell he's very, he's very upset by guys. Get Love your it. interest rates. 0896 111 uh, The saving habits in your house, is there a difference? If you're in a relationship, yeah. is there a difference? Or are you finding it easier if you're living at home with your parents or whatever it is? 0896 111 Paul Merriman, oh, financial advisor. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you. Put the vein back in. Fine. <laughs> Boom. Fine. Fine. Now, Fine. coming up, Brian Lloyd has got the pixel flicks ahead of this weekend so don't go anywhere welcome back from a heartwarming animation to a hard-hitting thriller there's lots of new releases in the movie and tv world this week and who's going to tell us about it i don't know who, who would it be, be? 
Brian Lloyd. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good, Good morning, morning to morning. you. How are you? So we're going to start with the the room next door. Yes. Uh, so this is the new film from Pedro Almodovar, very famous art house director. He did mm. a lot of like he did all about my mother. He did the skin I live in. This is his first English language film. Mm. It stars Tilda Swinton and uh, Julianne Moore. Tilda Swinton is his war journalist. Julianne Moore is a arts writer. Um, two of them have been friends for years, but they've kind of separated. Tilda Swinton is now dying from cancer. And she has decided to basically partake in euthanasia and wants Julianne Moore to kind of stay with her while she goes through it. OK, let's take a look at uh, the room next door. Ingrid, do you think I need to say goodbye to my closest friends? I think you should do whatever you want to do. I will not go out in mortifying anguish. Ah! I don't know what to say. I'm hoping you'll say yes. Yes to what? It's daytime. And you're alive. Okay, now I know you look at that and you think, oh God, that's gonna be so depressing yeah. and everything like that. It's actually not. It's actually not. You have compared it to a film that most people watching will have cried to. Most women watching yeah, will have beaches. cried to. Yeah, Beaches. And me. Beaches. 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 Yeah. Right? That's what oh, you've no, yeah. compared it to. It's very similar to Beaches, yeah. Isn't that that idea of like, you know, women and friendship and like how it can define a life together, you know, that yeah. sort of way. And the idea of like, even in their darkest moments, women will kind of cling to each other. And like where Beaches, yeah, is a film that you'll absolutely ball your eyes out. And I think this is a bit more kind of interesting in that like, it, it, it really kind of, it, it asks a lot of serious questions in the sense of like, okay, if you have a terminal illness and you decide that like, you don't want this to take you. You want to go out on your own terms. Should you be allowed to do yeah. that? Yeah. And what does that mean? Like, I mean, that's a conversation that's been happening in Ireland with, you know, right to live and right to die and all this kind of stuff. Like, and it goes at it in a very kind of adult way. And it looks gorgeous. It looks absolutely beautiful. Like you can see it in it, like that there's a whole kind of, uh, just the way they dress and the, the, and, and the set and, and the, the tone yeah. and all of it is gorgeous as and well. Julianne Moore and Tilda Swinton must be good. They're so good. Yeah. Like they're so good. And like when you watch Tilda Swinton, Julian, you would think they knew each other for years. Okay. Like that kind of level of performance. And it's not for everybody. I fully admit that. But it's what really are you going really, to give it like four out of five. And then right. afterwards, put on "Wind Beneath My Wings." And we're good to go. Cry the rose, and Cry it's all good to go. Now for something completely different, yeah. we've got Wild Robot. Yeah, so this is an animated film that stars the voices of Lupita Nyong'o and Pedro Pascal. Um, it's based on the book of the same name. It's about a robot that washes up on this uninhabited island, as in uninhabited by humans. Um, he then crashes into a, a, a nest of goose eggs, finds one goose and then decides to raise it because that's what he thinks its purpose is. And it's all about this robot raising the, uh, a little goose ah. from a goslin to a goose and then learning and teaching it to fly away. Sounds lovely. Let's have a quick look. Don't you see? I do not have the programming to be a mother. Don't be afraid. Ready? I can use a boost. I am a wild robot. Yeah, we have big smiles on our faces. That's it, isn't it? Like yeah. yeah, like this was the number one film in the Irish box office last week when it first uh, when it oh, first right, opened. Yeah. Really? So it's done really, really well. This will be in the Oscars as well. This will probably get nominated for best animated feature. It's gorgeous. Like you see, like the big eyes and the goose and everything else. Like it's really kind of evoking that old yeah. kind of classic. Disney, Disney, Bambi, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's funny. It's gorgeous. It's a great laugh. I really enjoyed it. I think parents and adults will get something, or sorry, parents yeah. and kids will get something out of it. Halloween parents. break, perfect. Halloween break, yeah, exactly. Perfect timing and for it. And big yeah. existential questions of nature versus nurture and what yeah. it is and that's, Yeah, cats. yeah. Like, I mean, like, parents will kind of get the whole thing of, like, unconventional yeah. parenthood and the idea of, like, oh, God, I'm not prepared for this at all. Oh. What do I do? Kids will just see, like, you know, the cute adventure. What and are you giving it? Four to five. Beautiful. Oh, lovely. Robot. Now, we're moving on You're to television. You're very excited about this. The yeah. Diplomat 2. Yeah, Diplomat season two. So if you watch the first season, it was on Netflix, starred Kerry Russell. She was this 
uh, career diplomat who gets uh, posted to the UK. She becomes the UK ambassador yeah. for the US. Her husband was played by Rufus Sewell. He was previously the US ambassador to Lebanon, but he's kind of fallen out of favor with the, with the president. Yeah. Um, so it's all about her trying to kind of get into the role, but also while doing that, there's this sort of, you know, machinations behind the behind the scenes about, you know, Russians in London. The second season, and it's it's uh, written and uh, created by Deborah Khan, who previously uh, worked on The West Wing. Yeah. So there's a lot of similarities with The West Wing to the point of, the last uh, season, it ended on a cliffhanger. Such a cliffhanger. Okay, such let's a have, cliffhanger. Let's have a yeah, look. Look. Such a cliffhanger. Explosion in central London. Can we find the Home Secretary? I'd like to be able to tell the ambassador whether her husband is alive or dead. Can you hear me? No. The American ambassador was nearly widowed last night. This was Russia. They've attacked us at sea and at home. The Tory party has received donations from Russian sources members of my government are involved, could be anyone. The call is coming from inside the house, and three Americans just got blown up inside the house. She is not a vice president. She's running with scissors right into my staff and me. I forgot. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, I, I think I love it. Don't tell me anything. No. But it's okay. really good. It's OK. OK, all right. It's OK. I'd forgotten it's how okay. much her hair never being brushed was a talking right? point. Okay. Yeah. Bad anyway. Sisters have released the trailer. The trailer. Yes, so uh, Bad Sisters season two is starting back on November 13th Woo! on uh, Apple TV. Uh, new body. This, I didn't realise it. It's been two years since the first season uh, yeah. was on Apple TV. I didn't realise it was because that Because there wasn't meant to be a second season. That's it right, It yeah. did so well. It did so well. So this time around, uh, it picks up, like I said, two years on. Fiona Shaw, the great Fiona Shaw, joins the cast. Uh, there's a body found in a in a bag, and they're so, all without giving it away. But like we know what happened at the end yeah. of the first season. So this one, so but this is one is the body the body that we think we it don't is? know. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, listen, it's just great to see the child of Prague making it their Apple right? TV Right, I saw that well straight done. away. Yeah. Uh, so that is going to be on Apple TV in November. No doubt we will talk about it yeah. then. And just to let you know, the Diplomat is on Netflix now. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we're able the to get this one. on the telly, the new one. Yeah. yeah, it's on Virgin Demand. Yeah, on so Virgin just play on Virgin Play. Yeah. So uh, this is the sequel, obviously, to Beetlejuice, directed by Tim Burton. Jenna Ortega was in it. Um, Winona Ryder is in it. Carson O'Hara is back in it. They got the whole cast back together again for it. Yeah, it's, I thought it was just in the cinema. Yeah, no, it's 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 the what you call the streaming window has just basically closed. So now you'll see like films like Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice coming oh, straight fabulous. back. Fabulous, yeah. a great watch Halloween watch. Then. Yeah, no, perfect. Yeah, perfect exactly. Time. Perfect oh my time god, of course, that's yeah. such perfect a great perfect idea. Halloween. Uh, Brian Lloyd, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Loads, loads, yeah, loads. This weekend. Yes. Now, still to come this morning, and get investigative journalist Nicola Talent on her latest book. The book is on organised crime. Plus, we have a sweet treat in the kitchen and cosy fits on the catwalk scene a few minutes. It's time to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. The headlines. Boy reported missing day after warning. A family member of Kyron Dernan reported him and his mother missing in August. That was just 24 hours after Tusa went on guard the Shia Kona <clears throat> and officially flagged its concerns for Kiernan's welfare. Blow to renters as new Airbnb laws shelved for election. Renters have been hit with a fresh blow after it emerged the government's long promised clampdown on Airbnb listings and other short term lets will not be brought in before the election. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. And finally, oh, sorry, and the Irish Daily Mail goes with election will be held on Friday, the 29th of November. Simon Harris will call the general election on Friday, November 8th for a polling day on November 29th. Senior government sources have told the Irish Daily Mail. Now, the examiner leads with Hutch held after police raids in Spain. Jerry the Monk Hutch is understood to have been detained in Spain as part of an international police investigation into suspected money laundering. Spanish guards close in on the Monk. An operation targeting senior members of the Hutch organised crime gang is expected to result in a number of high-profile arrests in Spain. That's the top story on The Herald today. The Sun and The Mirror also lead with this story. The Mirror goes with Put Your Lands Up. 61-year-old Hutch was detained in an early morning swoop in Lanzarote while Gardy also searched his home here in Dublin. The Star also goes with that story and it says it's Dahl gone to L for the monk. And we are going to be talking to Nicola Talent about that story in just a few minutes. But right now we read so many things yeah. in the first hour. We were talking about night courts being called for... Um, 
uh, to combat antisocial behaviour and shoplifting. We've got some messages shoplifting, in on that. Yeah, and Susan says, I work in a shop where there's been lots of shoplifting. We tell them that the CCT is everywhere and we're going to call the guards and they just couldn't care less. I manage a petrol station. There is a huge amount of shoplifting. <clears throat> the big problem is nothing is ever done about it. The guard, they never follow up. But I can't blame the courts or the guards because they are incredible. They're overworked and there's not enough of them. That's, That's what the thing. I saw it in a shop recently myself, a lot of these guys in on the e-scooters and one security guard and he says, I'll call the police. And I said to them, what happens? And he said, sometimes the police don't even come. You know, that's, that's the situation they are in. Yeah. We're also talking about 46% of workers are quite resentful, and I'm <clears throat> sure you would be as well, if um, someone always comes in late and blaming, oh, the weather, the bus didn't arrive, and so you're sitting there and somebody else doesn't, uh, doesn't arrive in on time. And Eileen says, I was working for 25 years and only late once. Give yourself wow. plenty of time. I live in North Cork and you can imagine rural roads in the winter ice and snow, but I still get to work on time. 25 years. Stephen, hello, guys. When it comes to people being late for work, you should ask these people, have they ever missed a flight for a holiday? 99.9% <laughs> will say no. If they can make a flight, they can make it to work. End of excuses that is, is true, what Stephen actually, says. Yeah. There was I've also, missed many a flight. <laughs> yeah. Have you? I've missed flights, yeah. I've never missed a flight. Um, a new survey no by Capital. Way, I've really? never missed a flight and I always leave at lastminute.com. takes them every three days. Yeah. Uh, we also had a new survey by Capital Credit Union that revealed that one in four Irish people only have 500 euros or less in their savings. Yes. And a lot of people had no savings at all. And um, we have a text in here. I'm a mar we're a married couple, early 30s, one baby and two public service jobs. Savings are non-existent for us. We purchased a house in 2021. We married in 2022. The baby came along in 2023. And now with childcare costs constantly robbing Peter to pay Paul, savings go in and always end up having to dip in because of groceries and bills and inflation. And we end up with nothing. The absolute stress of that. Yeah. When you're doing everything right, you've got two jobs, you're overworked. We'd love to hear from you. We've got more messages on those savings, but we would love to hear from you in relation to that. How are you doing with your saving? Is it something that's a possibility for you? 089 6 triple one. Um, yes. We are going to be talking to Nicola Talent after this short break. Thank you. Thank you. Now, gangland crime in Ireland has often dominated newspaper headlines and as one of Ireland's leading crime journalists, Nicola Talent has been at the helm of a lot of it. From feuds to murders to convictions, Nicola's latest book covers it all. It's called Web of Betrayal. And Nicola joins us now. Good morning. Good morning it's lovely Nicola. to have you Always here. Always great to have you. We'll get to the book in a minute because so yeah, much yeah. has happened I in know. the last few days and you were breaking an awful lot of these Crazy. stories. First, let's go to the raid on Jerry the Monk Hutch's properties in Ireland and Spain and he has been detained by detained arrested Spanish yeah authorities. he's been quizzed by the police in Spain it's a money laundering investigation that we're being told has been going on for two years mm -hmm. uh, the Spanish system is really strange so it'll be interesting to see what happens from here on in the judges will get the investigation and they continue to investigate so somebody can be before the courts without being charged in Spain for years. Oh, all right. Uh, whereas here, you're only before the courts to be charged, yeah. you know, so it's a slightly different system. And and yesterday when we were watching the story and we were watching the ERU and everyone going into mm. his house in, in North County, Dub North Dublin, um, had he been detained, like, was he detained at that stage in Spain or did they have to go looking for him or did he, did well, he they walk were into of, a guard the station? No, I wouldn't have thought he walked in. I, yeah. And there's some sort of a secrecy order being placed on stuff out in Spain, so the information is a bit sketchy so far. But it seems that the raids were coordinated at the same time. Happened in Dublin, happened in Lanzarote at okay. the same time. And he's in custody, whether he was lifted in his house in Lanzarote or he was discovered wherever later. Wherever he was after the yeah. raid. So whatever they discovered, they yeah. felt there was enough information then to go and detain him. Because another story that was all over the front pages uh, yeah. last your week story. was your story about him was he was going to run in the election. He was seriously considering putting his hat into the ring. Um, he had a campaign group, or has, shall we say, because yeah. I suppose it's not all over yet, is it? <clears throat> has a campaign group in sort of put together and has identified Corinthians Boxing Club to be his headquarters should he go for it. He's been asked, he says, a number of times, uh, you know, to go for it, to stand for a local election and 
this time he's considering. Um, yeah, I know, it's crazy. Well, I know, okay, right, so we sit here and we kind of look at America and we're looking at Donald Trump, a convicted felon, and we're kind of like, oh my God, this is craziness, it won't happen here. But now we're looking at something where he is the head of the Hutch organised crime group. Mm. We, we know that, like the Kinnahans well, and the Hutch feud, or he's involved in the Hutch group, Yeah, they were right? described, the Hutch group was described as an organised crime group during the Regency trial. There yes. was evidence put to the courts yes. that they were this organised crime group. They were familial, not as hierarchical as others. In other words, they weren't very structured. They were a fluid group, so sometimes they'd come together to work together, sometimes they'd work apart. And it was a patriarchal system. But from my memory, I don't think he was actually named as the head of it. No, okay. he is sort of seen as the head of it. He's the he was the one who was brought in after everything went haywire from the Regency to try and sort the situation. He would have come in to try and sort the situation initially between Gary Hutch, his nephew, and Daniel Kinahan when they fell out. He's this sort of uh, a few that resulted in eighteen people yes dying yeah being yeah. killed. He's a figure that is you know seen as the head of it, but. Um, Obviously, the Spanish are, you know, he's at the centre of this investigation. So they're calling this a, 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 um, a money laundering investigation into the Hutch organised crime group. So they have now detained Jerry Hutch. So, And then okay. you're, you're mentioning the Kinahans there. And of course, we, we saw this about the landmark treaty between Ireland and the UAE on extradition might be coming in. Mm. And that could affect the Kinahans because we mm. know where they are. Well, we've, there's one in custody, Sean yes. McGovern, and, uh, you know, again, information is very difficult to get properly out of the UAE. You kind of get it after it's been done. So will he fight his extradition um, or will he just be sent home? He could be sent home tomorrow. I could be back here with you in the next couple yeah. of days. So it's very, you know, you kind of know when things are happening. This is at government level now, really. Um, this has gone beyond sort of any other situation like, I've I, seen. I heard that they, they might just go to Russia. Well, they might, you know, that has been kind of on the cards. They've been working, I suppose, with the Iranian and the Russian regimes. Iran, yes, there was a yeah. Yeah. movement to go to Iran. Their, mo their money would probably get them in there. Um, you know, you'd have to stay on the right side of Putin to be it's, it's left just, there. But it's just mind-boggling, isn't it? The stuff it that's is. Going I on. always think it is when you think of where they came from. And like you know, at the beginning of my career, some of them were street dealers, and you know, here they are now <laughs> at the the top of a global organised yeah. crime group. And you've you've just come back from London, mm. where <clears throat> this was another trial that you were involved with, and this is a sentencing of Liam Byrne and Thomas Kavanagh. So they've been all over the papers the last few days. So give us background to what's going on here. Yeah, so they would be sort of the leaders of the UK wing of the... Uh, Thomas Bomber Kavanagh would have been heading up the UK wing of the Kinahan organisation. Yeah. His brother-in-law, Liam Byrne, was the head of the Byrne organised crime group, the Dublin wing of the Kinahan organisation. Um, and Liam Byrne's brother was shot dead mm. at the Regency. Yes. Bullets that were meant for Daniel Kinahan. So it's all, they all came together really in this revenge. Um, but the National Crime Agency went after Thomas Bomber Kavanagh and a drug, out, a drug running outfit he had a couple of years ago. He was jailed for 21 years in the courts there. Yeah. While he was facing that prison term, he tried to organise a plot to buy up a load of weapons, dump them in Ireland and hand them over to the NCA kind of an old school thing criminals would have done in the hopes to get their sentences shortened. OK, yeah. I'll do this for you. I'll do this exactly. for you, yeah. Look. I'll hand you this and you give me back a little bit. But it all but it, came undone. It didn't work. And they were sentenced there in London. Yeah. But is one of them going to be out by Christmas? Well... Or it looks like they might be out by Christmas? There's all... Like sentencing, you'd need a mathematics degree if you right. ask me for it. Okay. But yeah, they serve half, then they're out on licence. Um, they, that means the strict rules around it. And in the case of Bomber Kavanagh and Liam Byrne, the bigger problem they'll actually have is coming in December when there's going to be this serious crime prevention order. So there'll be all sorts of rules uh, put around the release, which could mean they can't hold a certain amount of money. You know, they have to sign in, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Very difficult to move around and operate. And all of this is connected to the new book as well. Mm. Because it, like you call it a web of betrayal, but this is a spider's web 
and it's all connected. So what is the new book? What's this dealing with? So this sort of follows, I suppose, the evolve, you know, the evolving gangland from when things start getting really violent through the story of an individual called Robbie Lawler, who was murdered in Belfast in April of 2020, months after he had kidnapped, uh, murdered and dismembered a teenage boy called T uh, Keen Mulready Woods. Yeah. And that was sort of the culmination of a very, very violent career he had. And he sort of lurched in between feuds, but in particular that Drogheda feud. Yes. Um, and then sort of his murder to me is just this seminal moment because you can see everybody sort of coming together north and south and these, you know, everybody, he's a dead man walking. Who killed him still has to be sort of unraveled properly. But you can see everybody turns on him. He becomes a liability. Right. For all way, of them. For everyone. For everyone, yeah. yeah. And in a way that, and he's so many enemies, like, you know, every little thing that happens kind of comes back to bite him. Um, you know, every, every murder he commits himself and... It's just so, like, mm. it does sound like something from The Wire half the time, and it's the world in which you operate. Yeah. And, you know, many years ago, there was so, a sort of a fait accompli between maybe the IRA and the guard. Do you know what I mean? There was, drugs were not as bad mm. up until 1998, 1999, 2000. Will we ever get a, a handle on gangland crime in this country? Do Probably think? not. No. And I think, funny enough, the thing about that book, Web of Betrayal, is, in a way, where is it going next? because each thing that happens that is, you know, when they cross another line in the sand, like that narco style murder of that teenager yeah. mm. was shocking. Yes. It was reported all over the world, you yeah. know, Ireland's on the map again. 100%. So, you know, that's been done now. So what, what, what's next? Um, it's a fascinating book, as always. I honestly don't know how you have time to sleep with everything that goes on in your world. <laughs> I, I know. And the crime... I didn't have time to brush my hair. She didn't have time to brush her hair this morning. The Crime World podcast is fantastic, as always. All your writing news you. of the world. But um, just to let you know that she does open up this book, Nicola, um, talking about her own crimes, and that's her penalty point <laughs> as she's trying to get to uh, crime scenes, as always. Got to keep it real. She's got to keep it real, and she does it with this. And it's always, you manage to put humour into these books. Web of Betrayal, the new book, Nicola Talent. Thank you so much Thank for joining so much. us today. Great you. to see you. Now we're in the kitchen with a, a sweet treat made of the perfect pairings. What are the perfect pairings, Marin? Edward and Hayden. Is that the perfect <laughs> pairing? Isn't that it? I think that's what we call it the country soft talk. Oh, oh well, no. Look, look at, at you. Darling. You're making a, a raspberry and white chocolate cheesecake. Yeah, so this is kind of like the American style. It's the baked cheesecake. Yes. So previously with you, I would have made, you know, the set cheesecake set with either a gelatin product or a chocolate. Mm. So this morning we're making a lovely uh, baked chocolate cheesecake because I think this just might be nice and Moorish for the kind of the midterm break that's fast oh, yes. approaching. So there's a bit of business to it. So I'm going to start straight away. Uh, if I can just show people really quickly, I've just cut strips of parchment paper and I'm just going to use those to line uh, a buttered springform tin. So I've used a uh, nine inch, which is a 23 centimetre tin. OK, then this is the Blue Peter moment. You need a piece of paper large enough to fit the bottom of the tin. Yeah. Fold it in half, then fold it in quarters with your finger along the centre of the middle line. OK, as it now is, fold it down into quarter, just like so. And then what we're going to do into a little triangle, point that triangle into the centre and where the centre meets the edge, just cut it or tear it and you should end up with not eight little triangles, but the circular Look piece for the bottom of the tin. Listen, I'm like the culinary Mary Fitzgerald. <laughs> Mary <laughs> make you do. do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> The other lady with the Kilkenny pedigree. <laughs> now, uh, then what I've got is I've got 12 ounces, 350 grams of biscuits, which I've just crushed. OK, so I've just used some digestive biscuits and I'm going to put then about three ounces, which is 75 um, grams of butter, which I've melted into that. So once that goes in there, I'm just going to mix that all around. So I have a little bit less butter than you would normally have for the set cheesecakes, because obviously in this instance, uh, the kind of the baking of the cheese cake is going to help you to solidify uh, the base uh, a wee little bit there as well. So give that a light little mix around, okay, and then I'm going to pour all of that into my cheesecake tin. 
just like so. And then what I'm going to do is using a potato masher, I'm just going to press all of that down so that we get a nice level uh, base on that cheesecake. Would you always use digestives, yeah? I, uh, no, I don't. Oh. Sometimes I make a lemon cheesecake and I use ginger nuts with it because I think that oh. flavour of the lemon and ginger works very mm. complimentarily. I've said to you on this recipe, you could use ginger nuts, you could use chocolate ch uh, chip cookies as well. Oh, yeah. Or, you know, if you had half a tin of biscuits, you could kind of use a, a mix and gather them. Yeah. yeah. Now, in here then, what I've got is I've got some cream cheese, okay? So I've got about 500 grams of cream cheese and I'm going to put in 300 mils as well of this lovely high-protein strawberry live yoghurt from Irish Yoghurt Clonakilty. Oh, lovely. So pop that in. So that has the lovely strawberry flavour, which will help you off. And again, of course, because it's high-protein, it's so good for your gut health as well, which we've all become very enthused yes. with in, in yeah. recent times. Now, just whilst all of that is happening, you can see here I have melting some white chocolate, so it's just coming oh. up. You were laughing, I was beating the white chocolate there just before the break Look at that. to make sure that we have that melted in time. Is that so just that's the steam car, the water bubbling underneath That's the that water bubbling up underneath it. And can I just advise uh, viewers and yourselves when you're making this, you see I've got a, a, a bowl that sits on the top rather than sitting down into it because you don't want the base of the bowl touching off the water yes. because that will kind of cause too aggressive uh, heat. So uh, it's just sitting on the top and that's now melted. Here then what I've got is I've got four eggs, okay? So I'm just going to beat those four eggs with a little bit of vanilla extract, okay? okay? And then I'm going to add all the other bits. So the uh, yogurt and the cream cheese is in there. Just make sure that that's nice and smooth. And then what I'm going to do is I'm then going to add some sugar. So I've got nine ounces, oh, uh, 250 God. grams a bag of sugar, of sugar in that. No, I've got about it. 35 grams of corn flour, which will act corn as a setting flour. agent for you. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to pop in my eggs, just like so. OK, Delicious. so that's my four eggs. So all of life's good ingredients. Yeah. It couldn't get better. Then pop that on down again. Give that a nice little mix around. OK, so we're just going to give that a nice little mix. And then the final thing I'm going to put in to this is just a little bit of the white chocolate. Bearing in mind that when we put in the white chocolate, it could have that capacity to curdle. So you need to kind of act nice and swiftly with that. But you can see it's quite liquidy uh, at this stage and perhaps much more liquidy than the, the normal set. Why uh, oh, the curdle if it's not cake. hot? Uh, if it, no, if, no, sorry, if it is hot, what will happen is you don't want the chocolate to solidify in there. So if you put oh, in the chocolate, yeah. the cold chocolate into that. So I'm going to take a nice big balloon whisk here. Just going to make sure I've got all the bits from around the sides. So people Whisk might like so. be freaked out at the consistency because it's a cheesecake, Absolutely, but don't be, 100%. but don't be. Don't be. Yep. Proceed with caution. Now, into that go. then I'm going to put in my lovely white chocolate. You can see that's really uh, nice and smooth. So pop all of that in there. And then with my balloon oh whisk, my I'm going to, oh my God, talk. I told you, didn't I tell you at the start, this was Moorish. Oh my God, okay. who's getting to lick that bowl? Don't put things in them, someone's going yeah. to lick that bowl. <laughs> As per. So you see now that's nicely incorporated. So it's the kind of the swiftness of action so can, is yes. essential. Can you explain that to me again? So it has to be it's in warm with the chocolate when it's, and then mix it straight go away. Go straight away. Okay, go straight away. And it away. needs to be warm, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Don't start kind of doing the Instagram reel at this time. Exactly. Okay, great. Put in a selection great. of fruit. Then I've used oh. some blueberries and I've used some raspberries here as well. Uh, whole and just in at the last minute, you can see I'm just barely going to uh, combine those in. OK, and there we go, just like so. Uh, that's little raspberry out there. There's a rogue always left, isn't there? And then into our cheesecake mixture. And that's going to go into the oven. Oh, that looks even delicious there. It like looks absolutely delicious. I literally want to delicious. go over and like get a I'd spoon. Probably, I probably should go. leave a little bit of that bowl as well. Yeah, I literally uh, want to go over and get a spoon. How long there, does that go in for? Now, me? that goes in for quite a considerable time. I have the oven set at 150, 300 or gas mark two. And that's going to go in there for about an hour. OK, oh, right. a, a good hour is what you want to give that. And then the resultant mixture is this left overnight. So I baked this obviously last night oh when I was coming God. up to you. And then what I'm going to do, just to garnish that up, I'm just going to put another tiny little bit of our lovely uh, yoghurt on there. That's the from Irish yoghurt. Give that a nice little rub around, mm. just like so. And then what I've got is I have a little tiny bit of jam. Oh, OK, excellent. and I'm just going to just give a few little blobs of jam oh. over the top. And then, and then with my knife, I'm going to just give it a little rub. This is uh, cheesecake now on speed, uh, or cheesecake with speed. So I'm just going to put a few little berries on the top, just like so. 
and a few of our little blueberries over here. Because I always think when we see fruit on the top of anything, can't we convince ourselves that it's nice and oh, healthy. sweet mother oh. of divine. And a little bit of fresh mint Will just you just cut it and give us some? Come on, we're it up. too long. Now, OK, How cut it up. Look at that. There's our lovely that cheesecake. Is well, stunning. now, listen, you could get it a little bit more beautiful um, if, uh, if you spent a little bit of time just on the top of it. So time will permit. Look. Now, Alan, what I will caution is a oh. nice thin sliver oh. uh, for yourself because oh, yeah. it is very but, heavy. And that's the beauty of this recipe. It so whilst loads. you have that made, oh. it will feed absolute loads. So think about it maybe for a little uh, soiree that you might be having at home. It's gorgeous. Or if you want it to be very posh that, Come on. for the trick-or-treaters. Try this. So it's absolutely uh, Look at lovely. that. It's absolutely so beautiful. It, it is a really nice Edward, recipe. as always, thank you so much. That is Absolutely delish. Oh, delish. Oh the perfect oh. bank holiday weekend treat. Oh, and thank you, I want you to make one of those each. Amazing. Back there with you in a go. minute on Ireland AM. Look at that. Mm. Oh, my God. Time for some fashion, and we're here with Rob Condon today. Hello, Rob. Good Rob. morning. What Good are we morning. looking at? Yes, we're taking a look at kind of casual, cozy fashion with a long weekend ahead of us. If you've got a casual weekend planned, if you're heading away or simply going for brunch with the girls, we have you sorted. Gorgeous. Our first look is you go for brunch with Sarah the guys today. Well. You can, but you won't be able to wear these. Well, yes, you can if you want to. <laughs> if you'd um, like to. Oh, this is very regal. Very nice. Yes, all of our looks this morning are available from the casual company. This is a gorgeous dress. This is a dress that you're going to be able to really dress up or dress down. It's that beautiful cobalt blue V-neckline to it, tulip sleeve to it, and it's all about that fit and flair, as you can see there, Sarah's moving in it. It's got that kind of 50s midi length. There's the swing to that. It's just amazing with those beautiful pocket details. It comes in various different colours. There's a really nice pink in it as well. But I think with this look, you're going to be yeah, able to do sleeves on so it much. Yeah, it's they're cute. just a gorgeous. Um, detail to it there but I think as well even like a cobalt blue blazer over this if you wanted to bring it to an event over yeah, the shoulders course. would go great with it or definitely if you want to make it a little bit more casual you could throw boots trainers Lovely. with it leather jacket you've gone with the nude shoes nude yes, heels here yes we kept quite neutral going with nude there so you could work your nude shoes into that look there or you could go with a boot to make it a little bit more casual or winter and it's going to work and you've, you've put a, a pearl headband yeah we're seeing lots of different hairbands at the moment um, they're really dominating the season so the we've hairbands got and the this. bows are very much in yeah, they're everywhere. So this is a really kind of delicate pearl detail to it. I think it really just dresses up any outfit by adding that kind of pearl detail to it. Absolutely Lovely. gorgeous. Sarah, yeah. thank you so much. That is a beautiful look today. We're going to move on to and our other Sarah, Sarah McGovern. Yes, here we are. Too. And we've gone a lot more casual with this look here with this really cool and comfy cohort. It's a khaki green. This is all about comfort with this piece. It's yeah. a throw on piece. It's a go to piece that you're going to be able to throw on. And then whether you want to keep it really casual or you could make it a little bit more funky if you wanted to, if you were heading out somewhere going with like a camel coat over it, could really dress it up as well but keeping it casual at the same time and yeah. um, it's soft material to it you can see there's pockets to it there it is sold um, together it does come in a few different colors as well and the sizing is quite good on it and um, also you can see the elasticated waistline yeah. to it casual company are great for doing elasticated waist so it's all about comfort with their clothes and I think even you could wear it as separates as well the yeah, top of course that kind can. of rib detail to it just makes it really sports looks and um, circular neck to it and then accessory wise we have gone with the gold um, hoop earring there. Oh, gold hoop earring, but you've got the runners as well because you've yes. obviously it's a tracksuit. You've got a gorgeous yeah, little. Yeah, exactly. Thrown on a really casual runner but, and those earrings. They're a really great piece to add to your autumn. Yeah, just to kind of dress anything up, and they are kind of picking up the gold that is yeah. inside the runners exactly. as well. They're lovely, they they're lovely little runners, it's actually, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They're a really cool pair of runners. You can see the gold detail to the side of them there. So I think they just add kind of a stylish update, and they are matching it with the khaki green and the golds in the jewellery as well. Lovely. A really comfortable and casual look. She looks very, Sarah, you look very cosy this morning. <laughs> so cosy. Now, we've got Hannah with our third look. Hannah is with us with her next look here. And we've gone with, actually, this little jacket will go great over the previous look if oh, you want yeah, to add yeah, a little yeah. bit of colour to it. It would work in really well with it. But I just love this look. Again, it's a cool, casual look and it's all about comfort. We have this kind of... Does it zip? Oh, no. No, there's oh, no zip on no there. Zip. It's, it's open. But it kind of has that kind of retro appeal to it with the um, shape to the collars of it there. A really cool piece to add. And then we've gone quite simple underneath it with this bodysuit, round neckline to it. That's going to be a go-to piece in your wardrobe because you're going to be able to mix and match it with lots of different things. Yeah. Whether you want to do it with a pencil skirt, a leather skirt, or keep it casual with a pair of jeans, um, as we've done this morning here. We've gone with the high-waisted um, jeans. You can see, again, elasticated waistline to it. 
pockets there to the front of it, and they've kind of got that biker style to the yeah, middle. The there. Yeah, the moto Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, they're all about comfort. They're a stretchy material. They've great sizes in these as well. And there's something that you could dress up these jeans if you wanted to go with a heel with it, a more dressy top. As knee high boots. Closer. Exactly. Yeah, they're um, perfect. They're going to work boots. with it as well. Um, now, we've, you've gone casual with a pair of runners. Yeah, again, it's really casual pair of runners. They're black and white, so bringing that monochrome into it, I think it just goes great because we've gone with the black jeans, we've gone with the white bodysuit. They're going to go with lots of different mm. things. And earrings, you've just put some hoops here. Yeah, earrings, we've gone with the hoops. They're quite a wide hoop earring to this. So again, they're going to add a little bit of style to any outfit, whether it's a black dress, they're going to just give it that really stylish update with the hoops. Gorgeous. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you so much. Sarah Morrissey is back Sarah for our is final look back today. back with us for our final look today. I love this look because I like the kind of oversizedness to it as well. Yeah. Um, we've got the jumper here. We've gone with the khaki green V-neckline to it. You can see the pockets to the middle. But it's kind of that cropped appeal to it. It's a little bit oversized. Um, and I just think it works really well. It's very, like, looks really cosy. Let's yeah. be honest, that looks really, really, really cosy. But I'm really interested in the trousers. Yes, the trousers. they're not tracksuit. They're no. kind of the barrel, yes. barrel trousers. They are, are they're they? that barrel elasticated waistline. So they're like a jogger, but they're nearly dressier. Um, they are dressier. Yeah, they are dressier. So you could throw a heel with these. You could throw a really dressy top or keep it really casual. And if you were dressing these up, you'd be getting a really sports looks vibe from it as well. Um, but a great pair. Yeah, because it is, you know, with the barrel trend. Yes. A lot, like it's kind of like, don't be investing in a lot because it yes. is a trend. It is a trend. But that's kind of a good way to do it, It is, it's it? a good way to do it and bring in that trend. And I think they're just a great piece to add to your wardrobe. They're a neutral colour, they're black. They're going to go with lots of different things yeah. in your wardrobe, but you're taking that trend box as well. These are oh, very, very cute cool. pair of trainers. Yeah, again, really cool pair of trainers. They've kind of got that black detail into them, which I think just works really well with the tones to this look. But again, they're all pieces that you're going to be able to mix and match in your wardrobe. Mm. Lovely. I was just saying to Miriam the other day, I just got every day now it's the, it's the joggers and the <laughs> oversized jumpers. I just. Oh, so you leave fun. here and you're straight into Yeah, I'm straight into yeah. it. Get no the, earrings, though. Get, oh, well, maybe some days. <laughs> I'm liking these. I'm liking these. <laughs> We've gone with a layered hoop earring. There's silvered layered hoop earring here. Um, and all of our stuff was available this morning from the casual company. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a million. Thank you, Thank you so much, Rob Condon. Cheers. We'll be back with you on Ireland AM in just a minute. This week on Ireland AM, we've partnered with Berry to give one lucky viewer the chance to win an amazing prize. We're giving away €2,000 to shop the newly launched Carol Byrne by Berry Fashion Collaboration, which features everything you need for the upcoming party season. From glam sequins to tailored separates and more. These are only available to shop on Very.ie or on the Very app. Whether you're getting ready for a work party, date night or family gathering, the Carol Byrne by Very collaboration has the perfect pieces to ensure you look and feel your best. For your chance to win, just answer this question. What date is Halloween traditionally celebrated on? A. 25th of December B. 31st of October to enter, call 1550 treble 9 treble 3 or text WIN to 57199. Best of luck. Good luck. Yes, thank you very much. Now, earlier on, we were talking about a new survey by Capital Credit Union, which has revealed that one in four Irish people only have about 500 euro or even less in their savings. Uh, Paul Merriman uh, was with us earlier on, financial expert, and saying there was in the survey of nearly half had no savings. Like there was no savings at all. They just were living paycheck to paycheck. Yes. And a lot of people have been getting in touch with us over that. Uh, on savings, I always thought men were better. Growing up, my brother always had more money saved while my sister and I were always spending uh, money. In my relationship, my boyfriend is better at saving than me, but that could be due to him making twice as much as me. So the gender pay gap does come into this mm. as well, to be honest, because we know that a gender pay gap exists. Uh, Jill, oh my God, my partner and I are polar opposites. I save every week and have quite good saving. He spends every shilling every week, never has a penny. Love, would you have a loan of a tenner there? Of a tenner, that'd, that'd be, be lovely. lovely. <laughs> Anne says, I'm a secondary school teacher with a post of responsibility and my husband works for the HSE at a supervisor level. We've got two children uh, who are under school going age. We've got a mortgage in Dublin and this means we live paycheck to paycheck. As he said earlier, we're doing everything right, but we are absolutely struggling to get by. 
This is a very interesting one from Valerio here. Good morning, guys. I'll be 40 in December. I've never learned to save money. My mother still gives out to me about this. I work full time. I love shopping and I love a good life. I've been renting in Dublin for years. Uh, buying a house has never even crossed my mind. Since I'll never be able to save for a deposit, my mind is at rest. So Valeria goes out, earns the money and goes, I'm going to not save. I'm going to go shopping and have a good life. And we'll rent. have to do a pension segment tomorrow, and won't rent, we? And rent my apartment, and pay rent for my apartment. Each to their own. Her mind is at rest. Yeah, Her it is. Her mind is at rest. It is sort of when you get that little bit older and you do think, though, you know, how do you fund when you're not working anymore? And, and what do we do? Because there is a big issue with yeah. the pensions going forward in Ireland, isn't there? Mm -hmm. But Valerio, we hope that you have an absolutely lovely weekend. Send us a text of what you buy yourself. Um, <laughs> oh, wait, nine, and where are you going? One, triple one. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, still to come, supermodel Ruth Crilly is going to be checking in. Yes, we'll be back with you in just a minute on Ireland AM. Hello, welcome back to Ireland AM. Now our next guest was a model in the early noughties, shooting in countries like Paris and Milan and getting paid to hang out with Jude Law. As you do. Ah, uh, come on. As Have you, you not been paid to hang out with Jude Law yet, <laughs> love? Terrible. Now, over 10 years since leaving the modelling world behind, Ruth Crilly has forged herself a successful career as a blogger, content creator and now author. Good morning to you, Ruth. Lovely to have you on the show this morning. Thanks for having me. Now, we were saying this, you began your career in the early noughties, but you should have been a lawyer. How did the modelling start? Do you know, I was, I, I was at a lunch break and it was Topshop Ox, um, in New Street in Birmingham. And they had a cardboard box and it just had search for the next top model written on the side. I mean, it was really low tech and you had to put your photo in through the slot in the top with your <laughs> landline number on the back and your height written on. Your height. And, and then they just got in touch with you. And then months later, they said they'd lost my entry. But I mean, I'm not too sure about that. They called me up on my home phone and uh, they said, we love your look. Come on down. And honestly, being in those days, I feel in those days, in the olden days, I feel like we didn't really know about working models. All we knew about was supermodels. And so, of course, I thought, oh, I've been scouted. I'm going to be the next Kate Moss, you know. And I went into the law school office and went, see you later. I'm off to London. <laughs> I'm going to be a supermodel. <laughs> bye, bye, law. bye bye, law. Bye bye, law. Yeah. I mean, how mad is that when you think about it? But I was so optimistic. And so I've always been like that, you know, I've always been quite unrealistically optimistic, still am. And so, yeah, just set off like Dick Whittington and, um, and left for London, which seems mad now. It's, I suppose now you've got your own kids thinking about someone doing that, but that was an iconic Thank search. You. I remember those top shop boxes and the girls that were then, that made it. Did you enter it? What was, of course I did, yeah. <laughs> um, but what, like Ruth, what was the reality then? Because looking with perspective now, we've heard so much about the industry and the nefarious things that went on. So what was it like for you to be a working model? So this is what I wanted to get across in How Not To Be A Supermodel was that, you know, 2% of it, I would say was, was glamour. But glamour and excitement that you could just not believe, you know, you couldn't make it up. It was the kind of life that you read about in, in books and you saw in movies. But that was 2%. The other 98% was going to castings for, you know, 10 hours a day, five days a week, and maybe for that whole week not getting a single job. Um, and, you know, as to the dark side of modelling, I feel like you know, those things exist. And I really, in the book, I really wanted to get those in as, a, as the underbelly of the story. But actually, the majority of it was just ridiculous. You know, it, it's, a, it's a ridiculous kind of world. It's chaotic. It runs in tandem to real world where people have got real kind of jobs, you know, because it's so creative and everybody is there because they want to be creative and they, they want to be there. Um, and I think it creates a very different atmosphere to, to live and to work in. Mm. And so that's when I wrote the book, I really wanted to get across that chaos. And, you know, I was a chaotic person anyway, and disasters were always happening to me. But it was that it was this whole different world, you know, whole different universe that we existed in. Yeah. And yeah, it had dark sides. And I think those have been really well documented. But I really wanted to write a book that was 
that that sort of captured that chaos. Mm. Because you, know? Ruth, you, you do mention in the book about like 80% of the shoots when you're starting out, you have to do for free because it, it's yeah. seen that this is part of the gig. And then even photographers saying, oh, you've the perfect body. And then another photographer saying, oh no, you, you need to lose weight. So as mm. even like that you started at 21 and that may have been considered older for a model, how does that mess with your head? I think that I had to become quite detached from my face and my body and almost see them as a tool in the end because uh, I, I think I've come out of it relatively unscathed, mm. although some would disagree. <laughs> but I think that is because, um, in a way, I think because I'd left law and I was always very academic, I knew that I had this kind of safety net if I ever didn't want to do it. Whereas, you know, some people I think that you're when you're really massively invested in it and that's your only opportunity, you know, you really want to do it, um, then you could feel more under pressure to... To, to sort of bend to the will of those yeah. things. Mm. Whereas I was just never really prepared to be totally miserable. And in the end, I think that's what happened. I grew out of it and thought, you know what, there are other things that I can do here. Um, and blogging had taken off. And so, you know, it's all in the end of the book. There's, it's obviously a lot more dramatic than that, yeah. the way it ended. But, um, you know, I really wanted to get that balance because the first thing that everyone says is, oh, God, you know, was it terrible having to say really, really thin? And, yeah, it, w it was, but I feel like in the late 90s, early noughties, our whole world, it wasn't just the fashion industry that was like that. You know, magazines were full of dieting tips and, and body shaming. Mm. And even on television, it was all, you know, women in Lycra on the morning TV saying, this is how you lose your baby weight. That's what we grew up with. So... I feel like it wasn't um, it wasn't strictly confined yeah. to the modelling industry. We had a very toxic environment yeah. anyway for mm. for body image, didn't we? And this is like this is the thing in, in How Not to Be a Supermodel. You take us on your life and what you did, and it's fascinating because you have done both the modelling world and you were a very early adopter of blogging and social media. Like you were there yeah. years ago, 2010, wasn't it? So 2010, yeah. 2010, like honestly, you were there before the game even began. So as someone who is in this beauty world, what do you make of the beauty standards we had back then? You know, the heroin chic, all that kind of stuff. And what we have now, what's your view on it? Do you know, I find the beauty standards now even more difficult than they were mm. then because I feel as though then we sort of knew what the deal was with high fashion and magazines. I mean, the shows were ridiculous. You would never wear those outfits. You know, when you look at Balenciaga, for example, or, you know, some of the shows that are really outre, you would, you know, no one's wearing that stuff. I mean, some people are, but, <laughs> you know, the, the normal person isn't wearing that stuff. Um, and so you've always knew that these makeup looks and these looks in magazines were you know, half of them were, were just sort of, it was artistic. Whereas now I feel like everybody's after the same face. Mm. So lots of young girls are getting loads of work done on their face, yeah. which, you know, each their own, but I find it, I do find it personally quite worrying. And they're all after exactly the same look. And I think that's a lot tougher on people mentally yeah. because um, there's no variety, you know, with modeling, it was all about the individuality of the face and, you know, they, they wanted novelty, they wanted newness, and they wanted people that looked extraordinary. And the whole key to that was people's differences. Mm. Whereas now, I almost think that the key to the, to the ideal beauty is everybody look, you know, looking the same. They want the same nose, the same cheeks, yeah. the same yeah. lips. I, yeah, it and has... I think that's tougher. I think that's tougher on yeah, people. It, re it really is. And Ruth, did you get just totally disillusioned with it? Or was there one thing that made you decide, you know what, I'm done. Modelling is not for me anymore. I think that the blogging thing had really taken off. So they crossed over by two years and I did start to go on shoots and think, you know what, I don't need to be freezing cold. I don't need to be, it wasn't like being treated badly, but it just, it wasn't fun anymore, you know? Mm. And I was trying for a baby and I was really struggling to, to, to have a baby. It took us about seven years, I think, in the end to have our first baby. And I remember just thinking this lifestyle doesn't suit how I want to be. I yeah. got married, you know, I wanted to settle down. I didn't really like being away from home. And I thought, if I'm going to be in Paris with a 15-year-old other model, you know, half chaperoning her rather than being at home, 
as an, a, a married woman, this just feels ridiculous now. You know, it just, I think I'd outgrown it. You'd outgrown it and you do it, you do it so beautifully in the book. It's gorgeous. How not to be a supermodel. It's such a gorgeous read. You're an incredibly talented writer, uh, an Thank incredibly you. talented model. You're a great crack on social media. Your husband, Richard, seems to have been great with you, but you kind of really annoyed him one day um, when oh, you got paid yeah. to hang out with Jude Law. We had only been together for a couple of months and he is a photographer, so he takes you know celebrity portraits and is well versed in what happens on shoots. But, you know, I woke him up because I got this call early in the morning. I went, I'm shooting with Jude Law today, <laughs> right in his ear, you know, he's just sleepy, with Rankin. And of course, in those <laughs> days, you know, Rankin was the enfant terrible of photography and he took pictures to, to shock and, you know, to get a reaction from people. And so that wasn't the greatest combo. And then I said, and it's in, it's in lingerie. And I just think, you know, his heart was sinking and thinking. <laughs> And naively, I thought that by texting him from this shoot all day, where I was draped over Jude Law, um, I thought that, well, that, if, if I keep him in the loop, he'll feel better about things. <laughs> so I gave him every half an hour or so, you know, I'm here, I'm just in my bra and pants, you know, but don't worry, he's really nice. And there's an, I think I, I wrote, there's another model here, it's a Jude Law threesome. Thing, <laughs> right? no, when I think back... For the, for the guy that's there thinking, oh, my God, you know, my new girlfriend, I'm really into. I mean, what a thing to send back in a text. But, <laughs> but, you know, he's out there with the dog in the garden. And it's exactly. He, it later, didn't, so it's it didn't affect him that too much. Well, as we said, um, <laughs> how not to be a supermodel. Ruth Crilly, thank you so much for joining us this morning. The book is thank out now. Thank you for having me. Welcome back. Now, the Cork Jazz Festival, it's in its 46th year and more than 100,000 people are expected in the city and surrounding areas over the next five days. Yes, now Derek is in the beautiful setting of St. Peter's this morning to soak up some of the festival fibes. Over to you, Derek. Absolutely, yeah. We're spoiled here this morning with a beautiful setting in the form of St. Peter's Church. Gorgeous acoustics, Brian, right? Oh, yeah, your voice just swirls around like oh, a like a absolutely vortex. incredible. Anyway, the Cork Jazz Festival kicking off this weekend for the October Bank Holiday and the legend, the one and only Brian Jackson is with us. Good morning to you, Brian. Good morning, Derek. Yeah, you? I believe you're off a flight from San Fran. Uh, well, not quite <laughs> right off, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Days. Yeah, yeah, I'm originally, I'm not from there. I'm originally from, uh, from France, from the south. I'm not originally from the south of France either. <laughs> but you're I'm there originally from Brooklyn and I just moved I just moved there a few, yeah. a few months ago. You had a gig into the early morning hours in the Opera House. How did it go? It was beautiful. Um, everybody seemed to have a really good time. We had hypnotic brass. We had uh, Theo Parrish. We had a full house. It was beautiful. We had yeah. a great time. You kept going to about two or three this morning, I believe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. The voice, hopefully not shaky. Anyway, look, you're a keyboard player, flautist, and a singer. I mean, has music and jazz music in particular always been a big part of your life? I, I grew up with music in my house. My mom and my dad were both jazz aficionados and they used to play music all the time in my house. So, uh, you know, listening to drums and listening to people like uh, Max Roach and those kinds of, those people, those were explosions and, and exciting movements that were happening sonically. And I guess you could say that was my kind of Pac-Man. I, you know, before they had <laughs> before they had video games. Yeah, um, of course, he started in the American music industry back in the '60s. Um, quite a pivotal time in terms of jazz and soul across the country. Yeah, well, you know, I think that uh, you know, the, it, to me, jazz represents the, the a revolution. You know, it re represents rebelliousness. Um, you know, and a lot of that I think is has has maybe been diluted in in some ways. But, uh, you know, the essence of jazz is, is really kind of rebellion and, uh, and, and, and truth. It really seeps into your core, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, it gets to you. It yeah. gets to you. I couldn't, I couldn't not do this. There's no way I could not do this. Uh, Gil Scott Hearn, you've collabed and worked with Gil for many, many years, nine years, in fact. Um, I mean, what's that collaborative process been like? Well, we had a great, uh, you know, we had a great 10 years together. Um, the music always came first. And uh, the music, we let the music dictate to us what to say. And, uh, you know, that, that worked really well because uh, Gil always knew what to say. He always knew the right words to put to the music. It was, uh, it was a great partnership. Uh, your music, of course, covered a lot of social and, I suppose, political issues 
of the day and it still does. Mm. Well, yeah, some people will come up to me and say, oh man, some of your songs are so prophetic. How did you know that these things were going to happen 50 years ago? And you know, the disappointing answer is that uh, we didn't write it for, uh, for, for today. We, we, we were writing about what was happening 50 years ago. And the fact that it's still happening today is uh, the disappointing part. This is Brian Jackson, your album that was released recently. No pressure there, a subtitle album. Oh, no, 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 no. You're the, an album called This is Brian Jackson? No, it doesn't matter what happens. Uh, yeah, define, <laughs> does it define your career or does it? I, well, I, I, I hope it doesn't, you know, because my, I feel like my career will be defined by the last thing that I always do. Yeah. You know. Um, I was listening to a song with my producer, Sinead, coming down the bridge that's rolling down along the keys. I think I call it morning. What a beautiful song. Oh, you like that Where one? Where did the inspiration for that song come from? <laughs> oh, you had to ask me, did you? <laughs> so I was, in, I was at Lincoln University in, in college, and there was this uh, the girl there who was like, she was a total church girl, you know, and I thought, I need to write a gospel song, you know? So I tried to write this gospel song, you know, to see if I could impress her. and. Uh, it happened to be, I think I'll call it morning. When I, play, I didn't tell Gilly any of this, so when I, when I played it for him, he just put the words, you know, that kind of meant the most to him. And, uh, yeah, gorgeous and lyrics. Uh, your music has been sampled by the likes of Tupac, by the likes of Kendrick Lamar. I mean, how does it feel knowing that your song is, does, does endurance, is a bit of lasting in them? It's, yeah, it's, it's mind boggling. I mean, you know, we're going on three generations now of, uh, of people who have enjoyed it. I mean, it's very humbling and, uh, you know, I, I just always have to kind of keep in perspective that, uh, you know, what you do is really, it's not for you, you know, as much as it's for your, for, for, for your, the people that you're, you're trying to, to reach. And I think that our message, our message, if anything, was that if you think you're a, alone, you're not. There are other people who think like you. Man. So interesting. Uh, Cork Jazz Festival. So it's your first time here in Cork. You said to me earlier on, it kind of feels like a home from home for you. It really does. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing how I've been to many countries, obviously. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of amazing how, how comfortable uh, I feel like I know. I feel like I know this place. Yeah. You had that gig last night in the Opera House, Triscoll as well. You have that gig, that live performance coming the, up. I mean, um, <clears throat> some of the hits you're going to be playing. Are you looking forward to the Irish audiences? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I've been looking forward. I played in Dublin last year, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, at uh, Sugar Club. Yeah. And that, that was another, yeah, that was another great. Uh, bucket list while you're here in Cork, what are you going to do? Have you had a pint of Guinness yet? Oh, come on, that's the first thing I did. <laughs> <laughs> you were like a sucky calf. <laughs> yes. <laughs> slurp, slurp. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, no, I mean, just uh, being able to soak in, you know, all of the, all of the atmosphere is, is something that, uh, you know, I've, I've spent some time with some great people and, uh, you know, for me, it's about that. It's about spending time with the people. Yeah, I know your twins, you have a birthday coming up this, their eighth birthday. You're going to play a set with a song. What are you going to play it uh, with? I'm going to play a song called Nomad. Okay. And it's, uh, it's dedicated to, to all those who might feel sometimes that they're out of place. All right. In for a treat. Take it away.
midnight land blossom with the truth that love is life well, gorgeous for all those people that are going to Cork this weekend you're going to have a great time it's always great fun Love the jazz, jazz weekend. Yeah. Love it. Have a great time. Thank you so much for everything this morning, uh, Derek. Now, coming up, we're getting our abs working out and putting on those old tote socks. Yes, we're going to be stretching and flexing after the break. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to Ireland AM. Today we are learning how to strengthen our core and improve our flexibility through a reimagining of the Pilates we all know. Yes, you might think it's a medieval torture device, <laughs> but it is not. Yeah, here to teach us how to transform <laughs> our workout routine is reformer Pilates instructor Aoife Lennon. Good morning to you, morning. Aoife. Oh my God, we're looking at this. So tell me, what is reformer Pilates? So reformer Pilates is Pilates, but it's assisted through the reformer bed. So reformer bed has a pulley chain, it has the pulleys, it has the foot bar, and it basically helps you assist you into the poses. So okay. on a mat, it's all body work, but this helps you do it. This helps you do it. Yeah. And it was devised when? Even? So it was World War One by Joseph Pilates. So he was actually helping the soldiers at the time and he put little strings or little pulleys onto a hospital bed. And then they were able to work out on in the their bed. rehab. Oh, Pilates, and that's yes. where that all came yeah, from. Yeah, it was actually originally called Contrology. Really? And then his name. Yeah, Pilates, Joseph Pilates. I never knew that. Now, yeah. welcome to Ireland Day. I'm very <laughs> new every day. Eva. <laughs> Can you, we're going to have Alan do this bit okay. first. Okay. How do we get into the bed? So there's a, like there's an official way to do this, but we're going to do the Don't, one that's most assistant. Just stand here. Oh yeah, of can, course. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to get you to sit here for me. Yeah. Right. You're going to hold on to the headrest there. Yeah. yeah. The shoulder of it. And you're going to pop your head down in here. So nice and slowly roll down. Good. So I put my feet through here. Yeah, you can. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. You can rest them above. Yeah, okay. if you want. <laughs> All right. Good. I'm, is that okay? Okay, so no, we're going to push ourselves back a little bit. So we're going to come back. Oh. So I'm gonna say... <laughs> yeah. so I'll just... It's your first time. Uh, no problem. I'm just going to take you out just for one second. Just the take you again. Yeah, take you out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry there, I'm just going to oh, get you God. in. The straps take are you on. Out, yeah, so you put, you're going to get back Sorry, now there uh, you go. No. Yeah. So that yeah. needs to be that. like that. Yes. Okay. Jump in. Yeah. Now. 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 Oh, so we're Good. moving now. Now. Oh, we're You're cooking sound. now. Suck a diesel. <laughs> we're cooking suck a diesel now. Beautiful. So what I'm going to put on for you today is about two straps. So usually, if you want to put your feet up here for me, Alan, oh. and you can just press against the bar for me. Hold on a second now, will you, for God's sake. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so usually it's three red springs, but for today we're Am gonna I do two. To be this, this was supposed to be that like my knees are nearly in my head. <laughs> yeah, so there's an adjuster here. You're going to have birth on Ireland Day <laughs> I'm gonna That's give what birth. It feels like. <laughs> right, so I'm gonna get your heels. If I can come Oh this here. moves. Is this okay? Oh it's moving me. Yes. yes. Is that what we do? There oh, we go. Now okay. Alan, I'm gonna ask you just nice. <laughs> Gently, nice and gently bring your heels together for me. Right. So bring your heels together, right together. together oh, touch so sorry, them. sorry. Yeah, and I'm going to get you to come into a V. So I'm going to get you to bring toes out. Gorgeous. And then I'm going to get you to bring your hands nice and long and you're just going to come down from the shoulders just a little bit. Beautiful. Right. Now, I'm going to get you to this take a big... feels... <laughs> this must look ridiculous. It feels so weird. Okay, I'm going to get you to take a big inhale okay. and as you exhale, I want you to draw your core in. So we're going to try to get that core engagement first. Good. Now, on that next inhale, can you push the carriage out for me? So push against the bar here. Beautiful. Excellent. Oh my God, he's a pro. Now, as you exhale, brace your core and resist as you come back in. So don't speed in. Go as slow as you can as the way back in. Oh my God. You've definitely been practicing. You've definitely been doing it. Okay. And look, before. Marin, you're up straight away. So what are the benefits of this? What are we doing right now? Okay. So we're opening our hips to start and we're also working the feet. So the benefits of Pilates are we're looking at, it corrects muscle imbalances. So look how correct you are on the bed. Your shoulders are totally even. You're oh. working. Yeah, from a posture, totally posture, muscle tone, strength, rehab. So we're going to start off with just a few in and out and we're going to try connect the breath. So take an inhale as you come out and exhale slowly come back in. Beautiful, guys. Inhale as you come out. And is this just a starting This movement? is just a starting position. Good. And exhale, you're going to come back out. Oh, now, that's lovely. What's the you're ropes gonna... for them? Where, where, where do they come in? So we can have a go at that. Would you like a little 100? What's, an, what's another one that you'd like okay. to show us? I'm going to show you the 100, which was classically, you technically do 100 of them. But 100 we of what you've just done there? No, no, no. The next one. You do about 10 reps of each of them. They're just like the little warm up and there's four variations of it. But we're going to put the hands in the straps now. I'm just going to get you to lift your head for just a minute. Or, no, your feet. Okay. 
<laughs> Sorry. Good. I'm going to take this right down. Beautiful. And I'm going to get you to put hands in straps so you can just reach up with the hands. Oh. Good. You look terrified you of feel... everything. Where does the second one go? You can just hold it in your hand for me. Yeah. Oh, so you can like that? There you go. Excellent. Yeah. And pop your hand in here. Okay, and hold them for me now here. Oh, you're going to hold, hold them. Oh. Yeah. And you're going to bring Good them pretending right he's ever been over the up. shoulder. What? You're going to bring them right over your shoulders. Yeah. Now create a bit of resistance. So right over oh. the shoulder. There you go. Do you feel the connection into the core? Oh, yeah. I can bit. feel like. Yeah. Oh, Do you want to have a go here? Yeah. This so is called the gonna... 100. This is called the 100. So what you're going to do is we're going to start you off. Just do 100 of them. Is it like that? Oh, no. It's a little harder than that. So you're oh. going to lift your knees over the hips. What do you mean over the yeah. hips? Yeah. So go right knees. in. Yeah. Balance, balance. There you go. We're going to bring the legs together in a Pilates leg. We're going to keep the knees over the hips, <laughs> brace through the core, hands are still do over. This. Hold here, and we're going to press down. Oh. Good. Okay, and come back up, and once more, press down. Good. Now keep the hands down there. Good. Take an inhale, exhale. If you can, try to find a little lift in the head. So lift your head up. Good. Reach, reach to the head. Excellent. Lift your shoulders up a little bit more. And now and pump through the arms. What? Pump through the arms. Pump right from the shoulder from the arms. Good. There you go. And we're going to go for 100. Good. So a inhale. Hundred for 100. 100. Of these. Inhale. Two, three, four, five. Exhale. Oh two, my three, God. Four, five. Eva. Inhale. Two, three, four, five. Exhale. Oh, two, this three. is intense. Good. Oh. Now brace the core. We're thinking ribs oh. to hip. Keep going for me. Oh. Keep going. Inhale. Two, three, oh. four, five. Would this be exhale, a basic two, three, exercise on reformers? So this is a warm up. Okay. And this it's is actually. A Oh. It's not as hard, and Warren, I think you can do it. I think we're going to find a leg extension here. Oh, yeah. Good. Heels come together, toes come out, muscles wrap around the bones. Excellent. Oh. Look at her go. Oh. Look at her go. Lift the head oh. to me. Beautiful. Oh. Okay, very good. You very need good. Tommy Bow here. Yeah. You need Tommy Bow here. <laughs> That's all right. Oh, there. You did very so good. What do you do with oh. these? Like, where do people have these beds at home? <laughs> yeah, so this one actually here is foldable. So you can actually fold this one. It's with Flexira, and you can fold it up and you can have it at home. And then this is their studio version. So it kind of Complements your studio. So you can process. bring that. You can buy that and have it at home. Absolutely, yeah. On Flexera, yeah, okay. their website or their socials. And yeah. what, like the overall benefits? You're talking about posture. It's about balancing everything. Yeah, it's... it was so actually how it got so popular was that it was brought to dancers in America. Yeah. And so ballet dancers, and it was like overuse motions, and they were getting injuries. And then they found, wait a second, this is useful Oof. for the common day man as well. Aoife, this is fantastic. Honestly, there <laughs> seems to be an awful lot of benefits. It's absolutely it everywhere. Aoife Lennon, thank you so much thank for this. Thank you so thank much. You. It's Thanks very so enjoyable. Much. It's <laughs> very enjoyable. Coming up on tomorrow's show, uh, something a little bit different. How to prevent STIs. It's a sex advice you need to hear, considering yes. the polls we were just in, my lord. Also, grab your denims and prepare to set dance. Bewitched are going to be on Fantastic. the show. Fantastic, an Irish country star. And BFF of Daniel O'Donnell, Michael English, will be stopping by. All that, plus uh, Blondie's in the kitchen and Cozy Knits on the catwalk. RLDM is back tomorrow from 7 and we'll see you next week. Have a bye great bye. holiday weekend. What a pose. Bye-bye.